Welcome to Flip Classroom. Today's lesson is on the introduction and conclusion paragraphs. When you think about introduction and conclusion paragraphs, think of these triangles. In the introduction paragraph, you begin with a broad generalization and narrow down to the thesis. The opposite happens in a conclusion paragraph where you start very narrow, you restate your thesis, and move down to a broad generalization. To begin your introduction paragraph, you want to start with a hook or catchy opening to draw in your readers. There are a variety of types of catchy openings. One is to begin with a rhetorical question, a question that really there's no answer as expected, or an obvious question that has an expected answer with a twist. Here's an example. Would you want to lock a mentally ill person in a concrete, windowless box for his entire life? Most people would say no, but how many of those people would demand justice if that mentally ill man flew an airplane into the World Trade Center on 9-11? So in this example, the twist is taking a tragedy such as the 9-11 terrorist attack to play upon people's anger. Another option is to begin with a quote. In this example, a student was writing about China's one-child policy. So the quote began, In a big family, the first child is kind of like the first pancake. If it's not perfect, that's okay. There are a lot more coming along, according to Justice Anthony Scalia. For families in China, they have to pay a pretty hefty fine if they want a full stack of pancakes, thanks to the one-child policy. So once again, it's kind of a cute concept, pancakes, linking to a more serious concept. Another approach is to begin with a shocking fact. The chances of being killed in a terrorist attack are about 1 in 20 million. A person is as likely to be killed by his own furniture, and more likely to die in a car accident, drown in a bathtub, or in a building fire than from a terrorist attack. If you are going to use a statistic or something very specific, make sure you cite your source and add it to your Works Cited page. You do not need to do that if the shocking fact is more common knowledge. Here's an example. An increasing number of kids are struggling to sit on the small merry-go-round ponies because they exceed the weight limits. In this case, there's no specific numbers used, specific days, or facts. It's a generalization. Common knowledge does not need to be cited. A third approach is to begin with the definition. Is the word uncommon? Do you have a new twist on a common definition? Words such as spoiled or hardworking or lazy. Let's take a look at the word altruistic. Altruistic is, quote, unselfishly concerned for or devoted to the welfare of others, according to dictionary.com. Some people have used their altruism to pay drug-addicted women to be sterilized because these financiers are, quote, devoted to the welfare of the suffering children, with very little altruism showing to the disadvantaged woman. So once again, this person takes a t new twist on a common definition. Whatever hook you make, it's followed by a bridge. So you have a general concept, a bridge that links you to very specific information, your thesis. Here's an example. Let's go back to the catchy opening that said the chances of being killed in a terrorist attack are about 1 in 20 million. A person is likely to be killed by his or own furniture and more likely to die in a car accident, drowning in a bathtub or in a building fire than a terrorist attack. Okay, now we need a bridge. Sadly, people are quick to label many violent acts as terrorism, even though they are actually acts of workplace violence or mental illness. This is especially true with the misclassification of the violent events which occurred in San Bernardino and Fort Hood. Okay, so we've gone from the concept of terrorism to something a little more specific, workplace violence and mental illness. Now we're going to get more specific. While the events have sim many similarities, the San Bernardino shooting should be considered workplace violence, whereas the 2009 Fort Hood shooting should be considered a terrorist attack. So the thesis is a statement that is going to be proven with evidence throughout the essay. 
Here's another example. This time, let's start with a thesis statement. As a woman with a Jewish last name, I've experienced racism, but on a far lesser scale than Tanasi Coates, because my light skin and gender are armor against the ugliness African American males suffer. So in this case, this thesis statement correlates directly to the prompt for Between the World and I. But before we get to that thesis statement, we need to start with a catchy opening, something very general. Let's take a look. Clowns luring children into sewers, poltergeists moving empty chairs, and chainsaw-wielding lunatics stalking teenagers are Hollywood constructs intended to trigger fear. But they don't scare me. I'm afraid of the well-shaven man in a suit on the hiring committee who smiles and nods as I interview, but secretly is an anti-Semite who would never hire someone like me with a Jewish last name. Okay, so my catchy opening starts very broad, alludes to Hollywood. Now I need some background. I need to take it from that generalization, getting to my thesis statement. As ta Coates points out in Between the World and Me, real life racism and discrimination in America are far scarier than anything Hollywood could produce. And now my specific thesis. As a woman with a Jewish last name, I've experienced racism, but on a far lesser scale than Coates because my light skin and gender are armor against the ugliness African-American males suffer. So now I know my essay is going to talk about my own personal experience of having a Jewish last name and racism, comparing it to Coates's experience and what African-American males suffer from. The conclusion paragraph goes the opposite direction. It starts very narrow. You're summarizing the main ideas, restating the thesis. Then you're getting very broad. The conclusion paragraph is where you demonstrate your critical thinking. You are to draw a conclusion based on the facts presented in the essay. You should also have a broad universal truth. How your essay topic relates to everyone. Why would your audience be interested in reading this concept? And have some global insight. What can everybody learn from your specific example presented in the essay? So let's take a look at an example. I'm starting with my thesis statement. My experiences with racism were painful and scary, but they were not potentially life-threatening like the type of racism ta Coates and other African-American males face every day in the United States. Okay. Then I move on to my critical thinking. I draw a conclusion. Our nation is built on the foundations of diversity, yet all people will never truly be free from fear and feel safe in their own bodies until racism ends and diversity is embraced. Okay, so now I take it to a broad level, a universal truth. Racism is a product of fear. Fear that someone who looks different from me will negatively affect my life. This irrational fear is not unique to Americans. People around the world sometimes fear those who look or behave differently. But there is a solution, education and a growth mindset. To end racism, we should dot 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 and go on with your answer. So as you can see once again I start very narrow and I move out to broader and broader concepts. So as I pointed out in the beginning your introduction paragraph starts out very general and gets narrow and the conclusion paragraph does the opposite. Gets starts very narrow and gets very general quickly. Thank you for joining me today in Flipped Classroom.